And this lie is that you only remain saved as long as you keep the faith. Maybe you've heard this, that Jesus did a wonderful work. Jesus did an amazing thing, but you got to keep it up or else. And so there's a couple of passages we're going to start off with this morning that people have used to twist the truth about our security in Jesus Christ. And the first passage is found in Colossians chapter 1. It says, He has now reconciled you in His fleshly body through death in order to present you before Him holy and blameless and beyond reproach if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you've heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. So can you see the scary part? Can you see the part that brings fear? It's this little word, if. And any time in the Bible, in the New Testament, we see the word, if, we start quaking in our boots and wondering, well, am I going to fulfill whatever is on the other side of that if? Because I better keep up my end of the bargain or God might just get rid of me. He might ditch me. He might abandon me. And so it's important that we take a closer look at this passage this morning. I want you to notice what has happened here. First of all, it says that they have heard something. Do you see the word heard there? They have heard something, and something has been proclaimed to them, and Paul has been a minister of something. So Paul rolls into town, a place called Colossae, and he presents a message. He ministers. He proclaims something. They hear something. But you know, as well as I do, that it's possible for Paul to preach something and for them to hear something and then just to say, well, wasn't that nice? And then move along to the next message, to the next Greek philosopher, to the next philosophical idea, to the next movement. And so Paul is saying, continue in the same message that you heard Continue in the same message that was proclaimed to you. Continue in the same message that I ministered because there are other options out there. Other options that don't lead to life, they lead to death. Other options that don't lead to salvation. And so, as I've said, you know, this is very much like uh, you, you bring three people up on stage, and let's say we've got one who's heard five minutes of the gospel, only five minutes. Another has heard five hours of the gospel, and another has heard 50 hours of the gospel. And now let's imagine that I've just had this amount of time with these three folks, and then they go home, and I decide that I need to write them a letter. I'm going to write them a letter, and I have advice for them, but I have to figure out what I'm going to say, because look at them. They're all in different stages of life. I mean, they're all in different uh, levels of exposure, five minutes, five hours, and 50 hours. They're all in different places. And so what do I say to them? Well, here's one idea. Hey, guys, continue. Continue uh, listening and believing what you initially heard. So this person with only five minutes, they've got lots of continuing to do. This person with five hours, they have a pretty good amount of continuing to do. And this person with 50 hours, well, they've already gotten a solid foundation. But let me tell you the truth. I don't know if any of them are saved. I really don't. I mean, they might even say they're saved. Uh, but, you know, when I write a group of... Uh, 100 people, 500 people, 1,000 people. I don't even know them all by name. I just know one thing. They need to continue in what they heard. I showed up in that city. I ministered the gospel. Some of them have already abandoned it. Some of them are flirting with it. Some of them are riding the fence. Some of them have already received Christ. Others have no clue about the indwelling of Jesus. And so what do I say to these people? Continue in the message that I started with you. 
And that's what Paul is saying. He's not saying that if you're sealed, you might be unsealed. He's not saying that if you're saved, you might be unsaved. He's not saying that if you're raised and seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that you might be dragged down to earthly places again. He's not saying that if your inheritance is reserved for you in heaven, that somehow it's going to get unreserved and taken away. I mean, we throughout this series, especially in this section on eternal security, we have seen so many Bible passages that lead us to believe we are safe in the arms of Jesus Christ. And we're going to revisit some of those this morning as we end this part of the series on security and move into the next part. But before we do, I want to show you the second passage that we really need to look into this morning. And here it is, 1 Corinthians 15. And I think you're going to find the very same thing. Do you notice that the word has been proclaimed and heard, but who knows Who knows what they've done with it? Here we go. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And that last phrase really solidifies it for us, because some people might not have gotten the whole message Do you remember in the book of Acts? In the book of Acts in the early church, some of them are getting a partial message. Some of them are getting no message at all. Some of them are getting a mixed message. And some of them are getting the true message. And so these apostles would roll into town and basically they'd say, Hey, uh, what have you heard so far? (laughs) What have you heard so far? And one group says, Well, I mean, all we've heard is about John the Baptist. John the Baptist, well, that's uh, like, uh, that's hardly even the gospel message. All you heard was a guy was eating locusts and honey out in the wilderness and said, stop sinning, would you? And I'll dunk you in water so you can associate with this repent from sin message. No mention of Jesus, no mention of the cross, no mention of the resurrection, no mention of the indwelling. Pentecost hadn't happened yet. And all you've heard about is John the Baptist. Well, you need a ton of information, sir. Because you haven't understood the gospel yet. And so some have heard a piece of the gospel. And maybe they have believed something. But it wasn't enough. They didn't call upon the name of the Lord for an indwelling. So that new life would indwell them through the person of Jesus Christ. And so what is he saying here? Hold fast. I preached something to you. Again, I'm writing a church. And I could write a church in Dallas, Texas. I could write a church in Washington, D.C. or Los Angeles. I could pick any congregation in the United States of America. And I'm telling you, if I write them a letter, uh, I'm probably probably going to assume that uh, maybe 60% of them know the Lord. And maybe 40% of them are excited about church and family values and conservative politics and uh, Christian principles and upright living and, and a safe place to raise their family, but they don't have Christ living in them. You know that's a real thing? You know that's a real thing in evangelical Christian circles that many people just gather together on a morning like this in order to share in morality and ethics, but don't yet have a personal connection with Jesus living in them. That's real. And so I believe that the Apostle Paul is writing this Corinthian church, this congregation, and he's saying, brethren, when you read this thing aloud, which is what they did, 80% of them couldn't read, so they had it read aloud. Brethren, when you read this aloud... I want you to remember what I have preached to you. And I want you to hold fast to the word that I preached to you. And some of you have gotten a piece of it, but you're still not in Christ. And so I want you to hold fast to everything that I taught. In fact, in this chapter, do you know what is contained in this chapter? In this same chapter, Paul says, this is what is of first importance. And he talks about Christ dying and then raising from the dead. And without the resurrection, they are still dead in their sins. You know what? If they're still dead in their sins, they have believed in vain. 
If they're still dead in their sins, then they don't yet have new life. And something went wrong in the believing process. Either they believed it was about cleaning up their act, they believed it was about rule keeping, they believed it was about morality and ethics, but somewhere the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ got lost and they believed in vain. So, get this, God is not telling us that we got to hold on for dear life. What He is telling us is that He poured out His dear life into our hearts by faith, and we are held in the mighty hand of God. He is the one hanging on to us. Now, you know, admittedly, these two passages are challenging, and I don't think we should form a doctrine out of the challenging passages. I think that we should look at the whole of Scripture and then come back to these and say, Paul, what do you mean in light of these other 15 places, right? Any good Bible teacher, any professor of the Bible, any person who's an instructor in God's Word would say, let's look at the whole counsel of God and all the passages about our safety and security, and then in light of these promises, let's look at these difficult places. So for that reason this morning, I want to just uh, take a few minutes to give us a little reminder of our security in Jesus. First, we'll hear from the Apostle Paul, the author who wrote more letters in the New Testament than any other writer. Here's what he says in Ephesians 1. In him... You also, after, notice what happens, listening to the message, that has to happen, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, all right? Two things had to happen. You had to listen and you had to believe. Not everybody has gotten that far. Some people have listened but not believed. You were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. I just want to draw your attention to this, the sealing of the Holy Spirit. A seal that can't be broken. And also, you'll notice the purpose of the seal. Why do we have the Holy Spirit? My goodness, there's ten reasons we could think of in a moment. Uh, he's our counselor and our comforter. He's our guide into all truth. But here we're seeing that the Holy Spirit is given as a pledge of our inheritance. That means our inheritance ain't going nowhere. It's rock solid. It's safe and secure. And we are experiencing a piece of that, a pretty large portion of that in the indwelling of Jesus Christ right now. Yes, we're going to get resurrection eyes and see God face to face and new bodies and everything is going to come to completion. But right now we have Jesus Christ just beneath our flesh and bones. And this is his pledge to us that, hey, something you have now, this inheritance is rock solid, unshakable and unbreakable. Ephesians also says in the fourth chapter, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, many people rewrite this verse. In their minds, in their theology, they say, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God or you're going to lose everything. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God or you're going to lose your salvation. Don't tick God off or He'll ditch you. He'll abandon you. He's done. If you've brought him to anger, well, Romans says we have peace with God. And you'll notice here that even in the midst of disobedience, a person who is grieving the Holy Spirit saying, Holy Spirit, I know that you're working in me forgiveness, not bitterness. You're working in me love, not resentment. You're working in me all kinds of things related to your goodness and kindness and patience. But you know what? Forget you. I'm doing this one my way. Forget you, I believe I can achieve my goals through revenge and anger and outrage. Forget you. So I'm grieving the Holy Spirit at that point. He wants better for me. He wants greater for me. And yet I'm still sealed until the day of redemption. Do you see that? So God is not putting a carrot on a stick and saying, here's your salvation. Come chase after it. You better hold fast. You better continue. You might get it. You might not. He's not dangling a carrot on a stick, threatening. He doesn't get us to behave through threats. 
It says the grace of God teaches us to say no to sin and to live upright lives. So I just think it's interesting, if not compelling, that this same passage that talks about grieving the Holy Spirit, rejecting His counsel, also says we're sealed. So, yes, there could be loss of contentment, but there is not loss of salvation. Yes, there could be loss of expression of Jesus in that moment, but it's not loss of salvation. God is not a a mafia drug lord up in the heavens, you know, threatening us and making us pay him off in order to stay on his good side. Amen? Amen. Well, I'm glad you amen that he's not a mafia drug lord. (laughs) We're getting somewhere. We're getting somewhere. 2 Timothy chapter 2 If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he can't deny himself. One of my favorites. I mean, really, I know we've talked about this already in the series, but it deserves a place here because I just look at the logic. The logic is incredible. He won't deny you because he won't deny himself, and he lives in you. So when he looks at you, he recognizes himself in you. He won't say no to himself so he'll never say no to you. Do you see that? I mean, basically it's saying that you're hidden with Christ in God. And because his spirit lives in you, when the spirit looks at you, he sees himself, and so you're stuck. You're stuck in a beautiful bond between God and God. This is one of the hallmark teachings of our congregation, isn't it? That God could swear by no one greater, so he swore by himself. So that by God and God, by two unchangeable things, we would have this hope. So that when God looked at God, he would say, well, you're a perfect promise keeper. And then God would look at God and say, you're a perfect promise keeper. And that promise keeper lives in us, so he is the glue. If you've ever wondered what is holding you and keeping you saved, it's God and God. And when God looks at you, he sees himself inside of you, and he will not deny himself. Isn't that cool? All right, Romans 8, Paul's convinced. Are you convinced? For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor lack of quiet times, nor forgetting to attend church, nor not witnessing enough, nor uh, stepping on the dance floor, nor he remembers your trip to Vegas, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing which includes you, you're a created thing, will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Are you convinced? Are you convinced or has the religious world convinced you that you need to measure yourself every day and see how you're doing? Are you convinced or have you let Uh, what we see as religion today, come along and knock on your door and say, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, and put a yeah, but on the end of the gospel. Yeah, Jesus did it all. Yeah, all to him I owe. But if you don't do your part, he's done with you. Are you convinced like the Apostle Paul, or do you still need convincing? Well, if you still need convincing this morning, don't worry. There's plenty of more fuel for us to do so. Here's more in Romans. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. What does that mean? Irrevocable. Well, unrevocable, right? Won't be revoked. God won't take them back. God won't withdraw them. So as a child of God, do you have a gift? Yes, it's called the Holy Spirit. Do you have a gift? Yes, you're a new creation. Do you have a gift? Yes, the gift of forgiveness and new life. Is that gift going to be revoked? No, it's irrevocable. Do you have a calling? Yes, you've got a heavenly calling, a new destiny. Uh, You're a totally different person than you used to be. Is God ever going to do a double wing back on you, as Rex likes to say? A double wing back where he says, all right, you're saved. Ah, just kidding. All right, you're new. Ah, just kidding. Y'all ever heard that double wing back? Because I had never heard that. That's a West Texas thing, if you've ever heard one. Double wing back. Folks online, try that at home. All right, we've heard from the Apostle Paul, and now let's hear from Jesus himself. He seems like an authority, doesn't he? All right, let's do Jesus himself here. For they cannot even die anymore because they are like angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. You can't die anymore. 
What are you afraid of? You know, the biggest fear is the fear of death. Besides, what was it? Speaking at the funeral, right, is the biggest fear. And then being in the casket is the second greatest fear. That makes sense, right? But I mean, we're scared to die. And Hebrews talks about the fear of death. It says they were subject to the fear of death all their lives. And what the gospel is saying is you don't need to fear that. We call it death in the world, but God calls it falling asleep. That's what it's going to be. Your body falls asleep and you are not your body. You're more than your body. You awaken and you're with the Lord forever. You can't die. John 6, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose how many? None of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. When's he going to raise them up? The last day. How many is he going to lose between now and then? None. So is he going to lose you? No. How long are you going to be saved? All the way till the end, throughout eternity, he will lose none of us. So you can't flub this up. Isn't that amazing? That's why around here at Church Without Religion and anybody who knows the grace of God, that's why we're excited. We're not excited because it's some sort of license to sin. We all know that we were sinning just fine before we discovered this incredible news. We're not looking to set world records. We're not looking to sin more. But we've discovered an incredible paradox. As soon as you give me safety and security, as soon as you show me I'm loved and accepted and that you're not going to ditch me, as soon as you show me that you're in this for the long haul, then something happens within me. I start warming up to this God. I start uh, realizing that I'm clean and close. And I start feeling respected, not abandoned. I start feeling valued, not shame. I start feeling clean and close. And I start believing, you know what? I can't ruin this. And then I realize I don't even have any desire to. I mean, in an atmosphere of grace, I start asking, what do I really want? And then I discover what I really want. But as long as I have church people scaring me to death, as long as I have Christian, so-called Christian messages putting the fear of God in me, that he's going to ditch me or abandon me or leave me, then I am behaving because of fear. I am behaving because of guilt and condemnation and fear and towing the line and pulling myself up by my bootstraps in order to make sure I squeak by at the pearly gates. And that is no way to live. And so what we find is that the security we have in Jesus does the very same thing that the security that that, uh, this uh, autumn is going to experience with Tyson and Lauren. I mean, as as she grows up and discovers that her parents love her deeply and accept her no matter what, well, that's not going to cause her to abandon the family. That's going to cause her to draw in closer and recognize there's security and there's intimacy and there's belonging and there's identity in that family. And that's what we have with our God. I'll lose none of them. Jesus continues. He says, I give eternal life to them. And they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. So, the enemy can't get you. First John says the enemy can't touch you. Here we see the enemy can't snatch you out. We've also seen you'll never perish and never die. We've also seen that your inheritance is kept till later, till the end of the days. So, are you starting to put it together? Maybe, I know this sounds crazy, but maybe everything's all right. Maybe everything's okay. Here's the thing about that. A lot of Christians, we're scared of everything being all right. We've never allowed everything to be all right. We got to be on edge. We got to be working for God. We got to be busy impressing Him, keeping Him liking us. Some of us, we've never known what it's like for everything to be okay. And you know what happens? Here's the weirdest thing about everything being okay. When everything is okay with you and God, you start being able to do a most unusual thing, and that is thinking about other people. Yeah? Thinking about other people. Love others even as I have loved you. But you got to know how he's loved you so that you can feel okay, so that you can stop doing this number, right? We look down, and I've, you know, 
I've uh, demonstrated this so many times over the years, but this was my Christian life for uh, at least a solid uh, half decade there. I was, how am I doing, God? How am I doing? How am I doing? How am I doing? How am I doing? I was looking at what I was doing, looking down at myself. How's my witnessing? How's my Bible study? How's my quiet time? How's this? How's that? I had my measuring stick out. How am I doing? How am I doing? How am I doing? How am I doing? And then what the grace of God does over a decade and more, really over a lifetime, is the grace of God says this, you can look up and out because you are okay. You can look up and out because you are okay. And that is what righteousness does for us. Righteousness allows us to look up and out because we are okay. We're no longer asking that question have I sinned too much? Is he sick of me? Is he done with me? Is he tired of me? Am I okay? Am I still okay? Did I lose it? All these questions get us self-focused and we can't look up and look out. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Well, let's see. Let's hear from the Apostle John. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. I love this passage. It's overused. A lot of people use it without thinking about it. But here's what you see. This guy, just like Paul said, convinced. John says no. So if you've ever thought about whether or not you're saved, please know that you can know. Please know that you can know. Because if it's about you and your walk and how you're doing, then you could never know. But if it's about Jesus' walk to the cross, if it's about Jesus being high and lifted up through the resurrection, if it's about the blood of Christ and the work of Christ, then can you know? Well, yeah, you can know because He has secured me. I'm not my own anchor. What about the author of Hebrews? Well, one of my favorite books of the Bible, here's Hebrews 13. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. And then we turn to God and we say, yeah, but might you leave me? You see, yeah, but might I fall out of fellowship? Yeah, but might you be ticked off at me? Yeah, but might you say depart from me? Yeah, but might you blot me out? Yeah, but might you spew me out? And it's like we don't understand English. <laughs> you know, and he just, he, he says, well, maybe I'll have to give it to you in tongues. <laughs> okay, not really. But I mean, how many ways do we have to get this? Here it is staring us in the face. I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. Does everybody know what dessert means? It's not that thing after dinner. It's he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never go, oh, I did not see that one coming. You have shocked me and blown me away. I mean, I died for all the other sins, but come on, this? You have got to be joking. God looked down the timeline of all our sins, past, present, and future. He said, blessed is the man whose sins the Lord does not take into account. Removed as far as the east is from the west. Remembered no more. And so this is why he won't desert us. He'll never forsake us. All right, what about the apostle Peter? We'll end with him. God has caused us to be born again to a living hope. You'll notice we're born again through the resurrection. I love that. Not just the cross, but the resurrection is what really saves us. We're born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance. Now tell me about this inheritance because I'm afraid I'm going to get paid less. Tell me about this inheritance because I'm afraid my mansion's going to end up being a shack. Tell me about this inheritance, because if I don't have enough bling in heaven on my neck, I'm going to be embarrassed. Well, here's what he says. The inheritance is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. How awesome is that? Now, it's none of the things I mentioned. You know, it's not about square footage or bling or jewelry or anything like that. It's about Jesus. But you'll notice that he says it ain't going anywhere. 
It's not going anywhere. So I don't know if you put the pieces together, but saved means saved, and eternal life means eternal life, not temporary life. And the end is already secured, and the middle is secured by the pledge of the Holy Spirit, and the beginning is secured through the cross and resurrection making you saved. So you're saved, and then you're still saved, and then you'll still be saved. And nothing passes away, nothing gets snatched away, you're totally secure. Here's another verse that follows. We are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. When's it going to be revealed? When's it going to be revealed? In the last time. Is it ready to be revealed? Yeah, it's ready to be revealed the whole time. So it is preserved by the power of God, ready to be revealed at the last minute. And God's got it taken care of. So conclusion, what did we see today? Well, we saw this lie that you only remain saved as long as you keep the faith. The truth, you remain saved as long as Jesus lives, and that's forever. Here's a passage to confirm that. Look at this. Hebrews 7.25. We'll close with this. He is able to save how long? Forever. Those who draw near to God through Him. Why? As I've said so many times, is it because you always live right? Is it because you always live good? Is it because you always do the right thing? Is it because of your consistency? And here's a popular word, your obedience. Is it because of your obedient life? No, it's because of his life. The one who was obedient even unto death. He always lives to make intercession for us. So we will be saved as long as Jesus lives. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We don't have a message without it. We thank you for your love as expressed by the finished work of Jesus. We don't have a message without it. Your finished work, your amazing word, your life in us confirming, your spirit counseling, your truth that sets us free. Otherwise, we'd be stuck chasing after some religion that scares us to death. Trying to jump through hoops and make you happy. Father, we thank you that you are so pleased because of what Jesus did for us. We thank you that we are secured by what you call the power of an indestructible life. Our salvation is indestructible. Our life is indestructible because of Jesus. We thank you. In his name we pray. Amen.